Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a church on Monday. Get it on. Oh, excited to talk to our old friend Tucker Carlson. After all, his news and triumphs and interviews with ex-presidents. Uh, this is an exciting time we're living in, Tucker. Are you really fleeing L.A.? I think so, yeah. <laughs> We've been talking about this for years. I don't know. I mean, there is something kind of great about it, as sad as it is. I, Maybe you don't flee. I, I know, and you keep wondering if we can do a course correction. And as I've always said, the answer to all the people who love L.A. and can't stand what's happening to L.A. is they go, we haven't hit rock bottom yet. And then I say, if you had a son who was struggling with heroin, would you need to see him flatlining with foam coming out of his mouth with paramedics over him with paddles? Or could we just see a few syringes around his room and say, we need to get you help? Fair, fair. <laughs> it's a good metaphor and, and probably not overstated. No, I think it's about, uh, it's very accurate. So, I'm excited, and I, I find myself mostly hopeful about this new world order. People like you yes. going out and, and bringing the truth to the people. And then that sounds, uh, you know, would sound self-serving, so you wouldn't say it. But it, what I'm saying is, is you and many other voices now, just in the last 10 minutes, going out there and being able to be a voice. And I don't think you could do what they did to us with COVID just three years ago today no. because of this. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, things have become, it, it, we're, we're right in the middle of it. So it's hard to kind of see, you know, the outlines you're feeling your way through a dark room, but it, it feels like we reached the very apex of media concentration and now it's becoming more diffuse in other words, the internet, I mean, you're old enough, you remember, I remember vividly, the promise was diffusion, diversity, every voice is heard, every voice can hear, there's a, you know, multiples of perspectives, you get to hear them all, and, you know, you get the news that you want. And that turned out to be the opposite of the truth, because the entire internet fell into the hands of a tiny group of like-minded people who crowded out dissenting voices. And that probably reached its peak, I'm thinking, I'm hoping, in 2020. And now we're starting finally to see the hope of the Internet fulfilled, which is that, you know, people can say what they think. You can know what's going on in other countries in a way that you couldn't before. I mean, I, I hope that comes true. That really would be a good thing. Yeah, and I uh, and, and for you, in terms of a personal journey, we talked about, and I'm always flattered that you came in here circa 2017 and sort of looked around and said, I'd like to be more independent. I would like to yes. do what I want to do from where I want to do it. But that was only half the journey, because as long as you're still on the mothership known as Fox, you can do the show from your den, but the show is presented on Fox. So you exactly. have independence, but not full independence. But now I feel like the journey is completed with you. It is 100% autonomy. Well, it's just, it's sort of like you, you know, you talk to these guys who spent a long time in prison and they can't wait to get out and see the trees and feel the air in their cheeks and get laid and all that stuff. And then they get out and they, they sort of miss the order and the routine and just the, the security of having someone do everything for you in a regular, reliable way. And I, I sort of felt that way. I mean, I've been in cable news uh, pretty much consistently since 1995. So, you know, that we're approaching 30 years, and that's a long time. I had complaints about it. I didn't really have that many complaints about Fox, actually. They're always nice to me and let me say what I wanted. But just in general, working for a big company is is suboptimal in a lot of ways. And then the second I get out, I'm like, oh, I mean, I don't know if I would have gotten out voluntarily, honestly, because inertia, but I got fired and I immediately thought, well, this is going to be a blessing. I just knew it. And my wife felt strongly that it would be a blessing. But the first thing I missed was just the order, the regularity, the routine. You know, I sit down at five o'clock in my little, you know, office attached to my bedroom with my dogs and bang out my scripts in the sweaty haste and then go read them on the air and then come home and, you know, tie trout flies or play backgammon or do what I talk to my wife. 
I just had that for so many years that um, it was weird not having it. But now it's been four months. I'm really grateful. I really am because you can do, I mean, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to be doing, but the travel alone has been worth it. I mean, it's just nice not to have to get your trip approved by, you know, some trip approval committee or budget finance or whoever in the giant company I work for made those decisions. You can just go. I mean, the downside is I have to pay for it myself, but it's not that expensive, actually, and it's worth it, and you can see the world. And so, I mean, boy, I've spent a lot of time traveling in the last couple of months this summer. I never used to do that at all because I was tethered to a show, and you just get a completely different view of the world. The world is is reordering. I mean, it is changing at a faster, probably an unsustainably fast rate as the post the, the post-war order which we've referred to all these years, is, is literally collapsing. And with it, unfortunately, probably the dollar and a lot of things that we benefit from, it's not all good, but it's certainly all interesting. And you don't get any sense of it here in the United States. You've got an elderly senile president who thinks it's 1962, and everyone else kind of follows his lead and acts like it is, but it's not. It's, it's a, the most dynamic moment of my lifetime. And the second you leave our borders, you see that. It's cool. Do you think about in terms of uh, the next chapter of your life, uh, to me, to my head, there's kind of two roads you can go. You can go a sort of big network, Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, you know, Trey Cla- uh, Travis, uh, Outkick, and, and that kind of stuff. Or you can go a sort of smaller Joe Rogan, you know, kind of independent um, podcasting route. Are, are you looking to build up a Uh, a network or are you looking to just keep it uh, more boutique? Well, I mean, you know, you can see the the truth is I haven't quite decided. I think you, you do have a tough time when you aggregate opinion voices under one umbrella, especially on the right. The left has no problem doing this. I mean, the New York times has thousands of employees. All of them know what the catechism is. All of them repeat it word for word. Oh, we're for trans black voices now. Of course, we've always been for trans black voices. Like they'll say anything. They don't care. They have no dignity, no self-respect, no sort of abstract fealty to the truth. They just don't give a shit. They'll say whatever the team requires them to say. And so it's very easy to get neoliberal voices to sing in unison. It's impossible to do the same with people who aren't neoliberals, whether they're on the far left or who, wherever they are, whether Russell Brand or you or me or like, they're always like, no, I don't, I don't think that I disagree with you. You know? So like it, it's, it's an inherently difficult project to bring a lot of opinion voices together. You probably could, however, provide a source of more reliable news under one umbrella, you know, with the caveat that you're going to get things wrong, but that you're going to at least try to tell the truth make a real effort, affirmative effort not to lie. Like you could do that. And I think the world would benefit from it. And you could probably do it on a subscription model and support it, you know? Um, So that's kind of where I'm, I'm moving at the moment, but you know, things are dynamic and I've got a bunch of travel to do. So it's going to be a minute before I figure it out, but I'm psyched. Well, I think you think um, incrementally or one dreams incrementally. You know, mm-hmm. when when I was on a construction site, my only goal was to get off a construction site and get a radio job. <laughs> right. And I always say to myself, I thank God there was no deal with the devil to sign. Because when I was on the construction side, they said, you can work doing FM radio for the rest of your life and nothing else. I would have said, give me that contract. Yeah. You know, I don't know how exactly. fast I can sign that contract. And then you have some success in that arena and you go into another arena and you have some success. But then at some point you step back and you sort of go, well, why not have all of it? You know, instead of being just gainfully employed, why not really go for that brass ring? But that that's a process. And I I, I think I've seen you kind of go through it. Well, it's true. And I look back on my I mean, because I, I did a very similar job for decades, it's pretty easy for me to compare different times of my life since I was doing the same thing. I wasn't working on a construction site when I was 25. I was in the political media in Washington and I stayed there from 1991 to 2020. So I I look back at myself and I'm like, I can't believe, for example, I supported the war in Iraq. Why did I do that? Now, I think to my credit, 
I went to Iraq in 2003 and realized I'd been completely wrong. And I said so. I didn't continue to lie. But I did go along with things I was uncomfortable with. I didn't ask difficult enough questions. And I wound up supporting something that was really bad for the United States and evil, in my opinion. So why did I do that? Part of it was I was young and stupid. Part of it was, I think, if I'm being honest, this was not conscious, but it's still true. I felt vulnerable. You know, I had at the time three kids. I've got a mortgage. Like, do you really want to pick a fight with everybody when you're 31 and you're just trying to like pay tuition and keep your shit together? Maybe you don't. And I think it's an age thing to a certain extent. Like at a, at a certain age, whatever it is, if you're in the same business and you feel like you've sort of done what you set out to do, you're like, I don't really need to impress anybody at this point. I'm not, you know, in debt. Speaking for myself, I'm not rich. I will never be rich. I'm pretty sure of that. But I'm not in hock to anybody. I don't owe anybody anything. And my kids are grown. So it's like, wh- you know, why would I ever lie? I'm just in a different place. And so you... You can't, it's not that I lied intentionally before. I mean it, I didn't, I didn't. Um, I I never have been in favor of lying. However, I did, I think I did not allow myself to think certain things because they were just too counter narrative. They were like, you know, everybody I knew, the world I lived in, in Northwest DC, like everyone works either directly for the government or is a, a parasite on government effectively, including people I love and know really well. And the media is too, by the way. I mean, the media is reporting on government, but it's also dependent on government. You know, in 2008, it became really clear that Barack Obama had been having sex with men and smoking crack. And a guy came forward, Larry Sinclair, and said, I'll sign an affidavit. And he did. I'll take a lie detector. And he did. I smoked crack with Barack Obama and had sex with him. Well, that was obviously true. Nobody reported it, not because they were squeamish about sex or drugs, but because the Obama campaign said anyone who reports on this gets no access to the Obama campaign. And so they didn't report on it. So that happens. That's just one small example, but that happens all the time with lots of different issues. Now, and do you, do you believe that transpired or do you believe the guy is legitimate or both? Oh, the Larry Sinclair story. Oh, that definitely happened. Oh, for sure. I mean, I've talked to Larry Sinclair about it. And, oh, definitely it happened. I mean, if you, Larry Sinclair's been in and out of prison uh, during one period, I mean, you know, 40 years ago, he was in and out of prison. He's got a criminal record by definition. He's, you know, poor. Uh, He's got a disordered life. He's missing a tooth. Like, he's not, you know, an Atlantic fellow. Um, He's not going to the Aspen Ideas Festival. I I think he has a record of deception. Obviously, he does. But this story, if you listen to it in detail, is clearly true. I mean, there's just, I'm going to do an interview with him and you can hear it. And again, it's not going to change the world that Barack Obama likes dudes. I think this was well known. Barack Obama said so himself in a letter to his girlfriend. And by the way, that's kind of Barack Obama's business. I'm not attacking him for, for liking dudes. I'm just saying the amount of lying in the media about it was unbelievable. Like people knew this was true. And it was quite obviously true at the time. And people who covered the campaign didn't say anything about it because they didn't want to lose access to the campaign. And and that happens all the time up and down government. So it's, it's almost like if you have a housekeeper, you think, oh, you know, she works for me. But if you have a housekeeper long enough, you realize, well, you actually work for her and you get caught up in her dramas. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, th- there's a weird dynamic where you, you switch places d- d- with people. In. No, and, and uh, by the way, fire her abruptly and she'll write a tell-all book about exactly, Tucker at home. That's exactly right. And, you know, we, we don't even have a full-time housekeeper, so, like, that's not going to be an issue for me. But the point is, you think you're holding government accountable, but actually they're controlling you. That That's really the dynamic in Washington. But, you know, you're living in the soup and it's hard to see it at work and... This is a long way of saying the conclusions I've reached are middle-aged conclusions. That's a lot of it. Right. It's just that I've gotten older, and you can't see certain things when you're younger. And it's like young people, you'd think they'd be the most open-minded of all. They're the least open-minded because they're afraid of the future. So they want to believe whatever storyline they've been fed is true. Like, the only problem with America is white supremacy, and like our tax system is fair, and Kennedy was assassinated by a lone gunman or whatever. They don't want to un, they don't want to face like the terrifying unknown and complexities of 
the actual world we live in, the reality of life, which is like, we have no freaking idea well, what's going on, actually. They don't want to admit that. Yeah, I would say that's true for younger people, micro and macro, because when you're 31, as you've discussed, and you're working for ESPN and you don't think it'd be a good right. idea to get vaccinated because you're fit and healthy right. and 31, <laughs> you are making business decisions. It's not even it's not about the world's future. It's about your future. You may totally just have crazy. gotten married and had a young child. And it's totally right. But this is why they hate Trump in D.C., because. And it's not as simple as like, oh, if I support Trump, I'll lose money. It's that Trump is a threat to this whole to the whole ecosystem of bullshit that makes Washington the richest city in the world and its suburbs the richest suburbs. Because once you start questioning things like basic things like why do we have NATO? Well, no one can answer that question. NATO is obviously a force for instability and bad in the world. Right. But no one allows himself to like update you know, their perceptions of NATO. It's like, no, they're keeping the Soviets at bay. Well, the Soviets don't exist anymore. So when Trump asks a question like that, nobody in D.C. can grapple with it honestly, because if we're if we're being honest, their livelihoods are tied up in things like NATO and Head Start and Medicare and failed projects that no one's allowed to reassess because it will disempower them. That's the truth. Yeah, my assessment of the era we just sort of passed through with an emphasis on COVID was Trump was going to topple the apple cart and disrupt, as you said, uh, the system needs to remain in place. And so they will attack uh, Trump. And then it started to bleed into things like COVID. And what happened with stuff like COVID is if you said, I'm against getting my kids vaccinated or I would like to open schools Um, in and of itself. Me having a couple of kids in high school and suggesting that we reopen schools or never close schools is just a subject and you could have a debate about it. And I think I would win. But the ad hominem attacks on me or anyone who said innocuous things like I don't want an experimental vaccine or I don't want to close the right. schools or I think the beaches should remain open in California and not close down. If you really just think about those, those are just policy arguments. And if you have got hold of me a few years ago, I wouldn't know who was on what side of that argument, Republican or Democrat. But now if you said, I don't want to take the vaccine, I want schools open and beaches open, you have outed yourself as a Trump supporter slash Republican. (laughs) And you don't need to be destroyed because you want to keep the schools Uh, open. You need to be destroyed because you outed yourself as MAGA. It's a hundred percent right. It's and that's, I think you're exactly right. And you see it up and down the system in places that are fundamentally apolitical. I mean, I, I actually was just this morning, um, with Dave Portnoy from Barstool Sports, who's like, genuinely non-political like not that interested but he kind of liked trump um i think he's actually i think dave's kind of a liberal but whatever he liked trump at the very beginning and he said so and he made the mistake of interviewing trump at trump's request at the white house and asked him a bunch of non-political questions about pizza and sports okay and again he's not interested in politics so far as i can tell at all and uh he's a sports guy and he said his life changed being photographed with trump made him the subject of like actual hate that, you know, he didn't understand. He was approaching it rationally. He's like, I I run a company about college football and wet t-shirt contests. Like, why are you hassling me? But it, it changed everything for him to the point where people yelled at him in public and it just, it just blew his mind. Um, Right. We just had this conversation weirdly. Well, I wanted to play a clip for you because uh, I had Chris Cuomo on this show and then I was on his show a couple months back and he made a comment about you and it's something that I've always thought about and I think there's a lot of, I now realize that everything is either narcissism or projection, but I, I would like your reaction to this clip. I want your take on uh, recent news of uh, your friend, Tucker Carlson. I believe your friend does what works for him. Uh, I think his uh, positions, I I don't think that if he had a gun to his head, he would say he believes a lot of the things that he puts on TV, but they work. 
And he's given, uh, he's created an audience for himself and a following. And I would be very surprised if he worked for everybody else because he has to know on his end of the political spectrum, he can be his own, uh, his own enterprise. He already has the Daily Caller. I know many what would you would call right wing pundit types or at least a handful. You know, I know Ben Shapiro pretty well. I know Tucker pretty well. I know Dennis Prager pretty well. Like I, I know these guys pretty well. They are exactly as they are in, in front of the microphone or without the microphone. And, and whether I think the idea of, Oh, he's saying a bunch of stuff he doesn't believe. I, I, I don't believe that he, believes what he's saying so i constantly hear it on the left where they go well we don't you know, that's he's just throwing out red meat to his base he doesn't have any uh -huh. he doesn't really believe that and i think to myself as you stated earlier in our conversation well how come none of that was going on about covid how come none of it goes on about abortion how come none of it goes uh, about ukraine how come i don't hear people on your side very with any deviation from the theme and in, in the narrative surely covid you should have had should have been going in a thousand different directions with opinions but you all settled on horse paste and sanjay gupta and and you know the people who weren't you know the people who didn't get vaccinated were causing the pandemic uh epidemic i i i wonder if that all that is projection well, it's hilarious to me. At the height of COVID, I was out fishing out west and and uh, somebody said to me, well, I heard that, you know, you you got the vaccine. And uh, some liberal said this to me in Jackson, Wyoming. And I said, who said I got the vaccine? Of course, I didn't get the vaccine. You know, I don't, I don't I don't trust the vaccine. I mean, whatever you want to get the vaccine. That's, you know, it's up to you. But I'm from California. Like, I'm happy to let other people do their thing. But I'm not. I wouldn't take that. My family's not taking it per my orders. Sorry. And uh, the guy didn't believe me. So I called my producer back in Washington. I was like, I had the weirdest conversation. He goes, oh, everyone on the Internet, which I avoid, is saying that you got the vaccine and you're just lying about it to your audience because you want them to die. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can't. You know, they call me a conspiracy theorist for pointing out that the CIA had a role in the Kennedy assassination, which they did. Um, I've never had a thought as crazy as that. Like, that's who could think of something like that? That's so deranged. I, I mean, my struggle, whatever, I'm not defensive about it at all. Maybe it doesn't speak well of me when I admit that I believe everything I say with total sincerity. I really mean it. And my struggle is to not reveal everything I think because... You know, some of my opinions are stupid or ugly or whatever, but, you know, like, I'm not pretending at all. Um, if anything, I'm, I think I'm, I'm trying to seem more moderate <laughs> than I really am. <laughs> well, I think the reason they always accuse people on the right as spouting off, a, uh, you know, the Fox sort of party line or, or Republican party line, I think the reason they do that is really a condescending reason yeah. where you give your feelings <laughs> on whatever the subject and then i turn to the guy and go he doesn't really tucker's a smart guy he doesn't really believe <laughs> which then makes you de facto sort of a lying nut and i well, think what's that's so what funny they want. is i spent my life in dc living next to my brother um who i'm really close to uh, my best friend and and now we live together again in another state and so i spent my whole life with my brother and he spent like me his whole life in washington so um, you know, from the from high school on. And we go for a walk every single morning with seven dogs and we climb this mountain every single morning. And we always talk about Washington, you know, our where we spend our lives. And we have no respect for the people who live there. We don't think they're smart. Both of us think they're stupid. And we don't think that because we saw it on the internet. We think that because we live next to them for 35 years. I have no respect for them at all. Nothing they have done works. They should not be in charge. They're not worthy of it. They're too stupid, actually. So, like, it's just so funny. The, the conceit that they're smart, where they call themselves, I'm a wonk. <laughs> you think I'm smart? They've never read a freaking book. I mean, these are, like, truly dumb people. And somehow they've hoodwinked the nation into thinking they're experts in something. Like, I literally wouldn't hire Anthony Fauci to do anything other than apply for government grants. That's the only thing he's good at. 
I would not hire him to run a business. I would not hire him to cure my cold. I wouldn't have him give my wife a pedicure. He's not qualified. Like, these people are not impressive. That's the actual truth. Well, uh, I want to ask you about uh, Trump, and I uh, have another interesting clip to play for you to get your uh, reaction to, and I'll tell you what. Uh, by the way, Tucker, you can uh, find him, Tucker on X, and everyone seems to be finding Tucker on X the last time I, I checked. So, again, exciting. I have so many questions. Do you think, apropos to sort of this, you know, you did the interview with Tony Bobolinsky for coming right up on three years. And it didn't move the needle in terms of the electorate. Um, and CNN and all the powers that be and the CIA and the FBI did a good enough job of getting the letter together and getting the 51 former security experts to sign off on it. And Twitter and, you know, all big, big... Um, the social media and all that they did a they did a magnificent job of taking that story three years ago and bearing it um i don't think they could do that today do you it's just it's amazing to me that any honest person of good faith could look at the facts that the largest and most powerful intel agency and largest most powerful law enforcement agency in the world u.s government agency cia and fbi rigged this election by suppressing that and just stop there by telling the social media companies not to permit it by lying in public they rigged the election so how could you and leaving aside any questions about electronic voting machines which are fair questions in my opinion and stopping the count on election night if all you knew was that how could you say that was a legitimate election it's not a legitimate election and if that was happening in moldova or Belarus, or Congo, the State Department would issue a statement saying that was not a free and fair election. We did not have a free and fair election. And I'm sorry, I don't care if Trump is boring about it or whatever. I'm reaching this conclusion independently based on the facts that I witnessed. That was a rigged election. And I hope that we never have another one because it's corroding the systems that we need to prevent civil war. So anyway, um, sorry. All right. We need, I, we need I, a quick, quick break. Happen. But I, I have I have Trump questions and I have another clip I'd like you to respond to. And we'll do all that right after this. Blinds galore. Love these guys have a huge Labor Day sale. It starts Wednesday, August 30th. All custom blinds, shades and shutters up to 50 percent off, half off. Mm hmm. You worked hard all summer. Reward yourself with custom window coverings from Blinds Galore during one of their biggest sales of the year. First place you go to buy custom window treatments and do it online. Trust me, they know what they're doing. I'm all I, the only blinds I've ever bought are from Blinds Galore. And it's all I, I'm, I got a new order coming in. So I'm actually getting on the phone with them right after this. Family owned and run, celebrating 25 years of business, designer quality, window coverings without the designer price. And if you have any questions, their expert customer care team will help you every step of the way, either online or over the phone. It's Blinds Galore. Right, Dawson? You work hard enough. Let Blinds Galore make it easy to get the custom blinds and shades you want in your home. Check out BlindsGalore.com during their huge Labor Day sale and let them know that Adam sent you. That's BlindsGalore.com. The Adam Carolla Show presents Tucker Carlson's Birthday Cocktail Party for May 16th. Let's see who's here. Let's welcome the inventor of the microphone, David Edward Hughes. American serial killer, H.H. H. Holmes. Former manager for the New York Yankees and the Oakland A's, Billy Martin. Henry Fonda is here. American CIA officer and spy for the Soviet Union, Aldrich Ames. Danny Trejo is here. From the Chiffons, let's welcome Barbara Lee. The guy who played sax for Bob Seger, the aptly named Alto Reed. Pierce Brosnan is here. Actress Deborah Winger. The NBA's John Sally. Janet Jackson. From Growing Pains. Tracy Gold, Megan Fox, and let's welcome Liberace. 
Tucker Carlson is on the Adam Carolla Show. Well, there you go. It's a pretty stacked lineup. <laughs> that is so good. So, wow. Tucker. Really okay, I'm impressed. Um, I want to talk to you. So I always think about this clip, and I'm sure you've seen it too, where Schumer was on, on with Rachel Maddow in January 2017 and basically said, why is Trump agitating um, CIA, CIA, FBI, these, these agencies? Why is he agitating? And then he says the quiet part out loud. They will destroy you, which I think turned out to be a lot of what we saw. But at the very end, it's a little part I missed, and I think we should give it a quick listen. But he's he's taking these shots, this antagonism, yep. this taunting to the intelligence Let me tell community. You, you take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. So even for a practical, supposedly hard-nosed businessman, he's being really dumb to do this. What do you think the intelligence community would do if they were motivated? I don't know, to? but I from what I am told, they are very upset with how he has treated them and talked about them. And we need the intelligence community. We don't know what's going Look at the Russian hacking. Without the intelligence community, we wouldn't have uh, discovered it. And then he goes on to cite something that didn't happen, that the intelligence community cooked up to take down Trump as an example of why we need them. It's... Yeah, I'm, I mean, I've heard that clip a thousand times every time it renders me speechless. That's the end of democracy. And I don't know how you can, in the same sentence, say I'm for democracy and then say, actually, our country is run by a shadowy intel agency. No one elected and no one has oversight over. I mean, it, that's it's not a democratic republic. If the CIA can punish you as an elected president for doing things that they don't like, they're your employees. Speaking of the housekeeper taking over the house, they're like your housekeeper. Shut up and make the bed. Like the, the point of the CIA, as originally conceived, was to inform the president of what's going on around the world so he can make better foreign policy decisions. So the intel gathering apparatus of the U.S. president, they work for him. They have no constitutional legitimacy outside of him. Our system's super simple. The people who are elected by the public have all the power. They have employees to whom they delegate that power to get things done. But those employees have no independent power at all and no independent legitimacy. The CIA is a totally illegitimate criminal organization unless it is following precisely the orders of the elected president. Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. So he's describing a crime. The people committing that crime in CIA should be in prison for long terms. They, that's the great threat to democracy right there. And the fact that no one on that set could even see that tells you how deeply corrupted they are. That's terrifying. And it's true, I happen to know. And I could bore you for hours, again, since I spent my life there and know a lot of people who work there. But the bottom line is there's no oversight at all. They were able to participate in the murder of a U.S. president and then hide that fact for 60 years by keeping those documents classified, which they still are. It's unbelievable. And it's happening in front of all of us. And nobody seems to care. But... You know, as the country declines and the democratic institutions weaken and you wonder, how did this happen? Well, that's how it happened right there. What do you think the future holds? Is it? I don't know. I mean, are they going to let Trump be president? No, of course. I mean, look, if, you know, they protested him, they called him names. He won anyway. They impeached him twice on ridiculous pretenses. They it, it, <laughs> fabricated a lot about what happened on January 6th in order to impeach him again. It didn't work. He came back. Then they indicted him. It didn't work. He became more popular. Then they indicted him three more times. And every single time his popularity rose. So if you begin with criticism, then you go to protest, then you go to impeachment, now you go to indictment, and none of them work, what's next? I mean, let, you know, graph it out, man. We're speeding toward assassination, obviously, and no one will say that, but I don't, I don't know how you can't reach that conclusion. You know what I mean? Like, they have decided, permanent Washington, both parties have decided that there's something about Trump that's, that's so threatening to them, they just can't have him. I mean, they're putting him on trial in March of next year in the J6 case 
which basically consists of trying to send him to prison for the rest of his life for complaining about the last election. That's literally what it is. Again, if this were happening in Moldova, the State Department would issue an all-hands-on-deck order to let the world know this is not a legitimate government. And yet our government is doing it. It's like it, I, it's, it's really it's hard to overstate how bad this is. And I'm not I, I don't I don't know where it's going, but there's a collision that's clearly imminent. And by the way, the president is senile in a way that's impossible to deny. Biden's not running the government, you know, so like. I don't know. I've never been this worried about anything as I am about where this is going. Well, I think if we sort of break it down into sort of steps or chapters, um, we have this and then a possible solution at the end of the book. So uh, chapter one, the government is doing what they've been doing and we've not been aware of it for most of its existence. And we just sort of went along with it, you know, but the government is big and it's deep and it's, it's very interested in hanging on to its power and all the agencies we've meant, we've mentioned before this. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the part that most Americans didn't see coming is how the media was also very complicit in this and got sucked into the governmental side of it because they're the town criers. They're going to have to ring the bell and inform everyone in the town what the government is doing. So in certain cases, uh, when it comes to Trump and Russian collusion and Putin's puppet, that they need to add a lot of creatine to and steroids to and really build that thing up, if not create it from whole cloth. Uh, when it comes to Hunter Biden's laptop, that needs to be crushed and smashed. Uh, when it comes to COVID, Fauci needs to be elevated and anybody in the B Great Barrington Declaration needs to be pulled off of Twitter and destroyed. So that's the media and that's what they're doing. Uh, then that trickles down to the people. And then when you talk to most people, they're really just saying what they heard from the media, who they think is unbiased, but is really doing the work of the government. So now we have a triple threat. We have the government doing what they need to do. They have the media with their marching orders. And then there's the good people of the village who really don't know what's going on. They just watch CNN or they watch Rachel Maddow talk to Chuck Schumer and they go, well, that must be the way the way it is and they get sucked into it and almost can't be blamed because they're more naive than they are evil for sure the average citizen now there are people like yourself and there's all these other entities and there's all these other platforms and they can no longer corral everybody the 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 sheep are getting over the fence the gate got knocked open and now there's a lot of different voices from a lot of different places. And really, for the first time, I'm hearing sort of normal, non-political people asking questions about Biden or the laptop or Russian collusion or what their you know, persecution of Trump and that kind of stuff. And the question is, is can voices like yourself and these alternative media platforms, can they arrive in time to stop it? Yeah, that's unknown. Um you know, here's here's my view of it. Um, I think the lies are, are are unsustainable. Lying is always unsustainable. You're always found out in the end, whether in your lifetime or posthumously. But your you know lies are always revealed by their nature, and these lies are so big and so obvious and so stupid that it's going to be very clear to the majority of voters before the election that the Biden administration has no idea what it's doing, that Joe Biden is not running the government, and that it's not working at all. And, it, and I think by that point, we're going to have a real economic contraction. I think we're going to be in the in the teeth of a very tough recession, and that makes everything much more intense. And so if your goal is to maintain power, and if you think once you relinquish power, the problem with everything becoming, the problem with criminalizing politics is the people who do it imagine or know that it will be done to them. So once you start indicting your political opponents, you know that you have to win or else they're going to indict you if they win. Right. Right. And so they can't lose. They will do anything to win. So how do they do that? They're not going to do COVID again. I know everyone on the right is afraid they're going to do COVID and mask mandate. They're not going to do that. They can't do that. If they've already been exposed, that won't work. There's going to be. No. What are they going to do? They're going to go to war with Russia is what they're going to do. There will be a hot war between the United States and Russia 
in the next year. And really? On the, of, yes, of course. They want it anyway. Um, I don't think we'll win it, but that's a separate analysis. But I think it's a political matter. They need to declare war footing in order to assume war powers in order to win. I believe that. And I think well, the evidence suggests that's true. So if you're worried about our politics getting like even more vicious than it already is and people being hurt in our politics, which is entirely possible, you should be worried about the prospect of an open war. We're already at war with Russia, of course. We're, we're funding their enemies. So we're fighting Russia. But I mean, an open battle with Russia where we say we're at war with Russia. I think that could easily happen. Uh, you know, I think we could Tonkin gulf our way into it where all of a sudden missiles land in Poland. The Russians did it. Our NATO allies has been attacked. We're going to war. I could see that happening very easily. So if you're worried about that, you need to put as much pressure as you possibly can on the Republican held Senate to force a peace, which can be done. The United States could force a peace in Ukraine tonight. We're funding one side. There is no Ukrainian army outside of NATO. If NATO withdrew its support for Ukraine, Ukraine would crumble in a day. So we are the only power in the world that can bring both sides to the table to force a peace, which will be unsatisfactory as all forced pieces are. Like each side will give more than it wants, but that's the only option. Otherwise, we I would bet my house on it. We are going to war with Russia. And of course, the stakes are, are everything, our life on the planet. I mean, these are the two biggest nuclear arsenals in the world facing off against each other so like this is insane they're insane these are people who think men can become women who believe that face masks save you from covid i mean these are not rational people would they go to war with russia of course they would again they want to anyway and well, i don't know why republicans don't get this at all but they don't seem to get it and meanwhile republican leaders and mitch mcconnell see now too so i don't even blame him but all this stupid Republican senators and McCarthy in the House. I mean, it's pathetic. Um, these people are all on board with the war against Russia. Why? Well, I think it may even be scarier because you say they believe masks work or they believe men can become women and so on and so forth. I don't know that they believe that. I think well, it, it may be right. worse. I think, I think they can you, say you, or do anything to hang on to power. Their, their view of Russia is very, uh, and I can say this as someone who was, you know, against the Soviets when it mattered, um, when they existed, uh, but I'm maybe the only person in the United States who doesn't really have very strong feelings about Russia. I don't, I don't, I'm not that interested in Russia. I don't see it as our enemy or ally. I just don't have strong emotions about Russia. So I look at this and I see true hysteria, like they've convinced themselves that our global enemy is Russia. And I really think they mean that. And I certainly the Republicans mean it, you know, the Nikki Haley, Mike Pence, you know, the low IQ wing of the Republican party, which is most of the Republican party is low IQ at the leadership level. They all think that, and they mean it. And like someone needs to slap them awake. You're leading this country to its destruction. We've already lost control of the world. The American empire's in free fall right now, and we're going to lose the U S dollar. And when that happens, we're going to have real poverty here, like Great Depression level poverty. And it comes from this war. And I don't understand why no one else can see this, but it's super obvious once you leave, the, go spend a week in Europe and talk to smart people on both sides. Like it doesn't matter what their politics are and ask them like, what, what effect do you think the war in Ukraine has had on American leadership in Europe? <laughs> Dude. And by the way, Western Europe is our only reliable ally in the world. We only have one out, real ally. Um, and that's Western Europe. And Western Europe is being destroyed by this. The German economy was crushed when the Biden administration blew up Nord Stream. I know nobody cares. But if you think like long term about this, they're really kicking the legs out from under this country in a way that is not possible to repair, at least in the short term. Well, speaking of Russia, I have uh, one more clip to play, which I'm always delighted by. And I think you've seen the clip and everyone's seen and heard the clip, but they forgot about what happened at the end of the clip, which which I thought was very telling, which is, and I know it's a subject that's near and dear to your heart, which is us just arguing about race nonstop while, <laughs> while you know, we're on the brink of a hot war with Russia and we're just arguing about race constantly, which always feels like part of the plan in terms of a distraction. Uh, but I'll play this clip from the uh, October 
2020 debate with uh, with Trump and Biden. But the part you need to really listen to is the part where they want to get back to the subject at hand. Let me ask some follow me. Please respond. If and then this we're going to have stuff follow-up is questions. true about Russia, Ukraine, China, other countries, Iraq. If this is true, then he's a corrupt politician. Right. So don't give me the stuff about how you're this innocent baby. Joe, they're calling you a corrupt politician. Nobody. Hey, President Trump, Trump I want to stay hell. on the issue Excuse of me. race. Take we're talking the about the issue. Laptop from hell. President Trump, Nobody. We're, we're talking about race right now, and I do want to stay on the issue of race. President Trump, and you've I have dis- to respond to that. Please. Because look, Very quickly. there are 50 former national intelligence folks who said that what this he's accusing me of is a Russian plan. They have said that this is, has all the care. Four, five former heads of the CIA, both parties, say what he's saying is a bunch of garbage. Nobody believes it except the, his and his good friend, Rudy Gianni. You mean the laptop is now yeah. another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax? And you that's exactly be. what, is this that's where exactly you're what This is going. where he's going. The that, laptop right. is Russia, yes. Russia, Gentlemen, Russia. I want to stay on the issue of race. You okay? have to be kidding. Mr. Here we go President, again with Russia. We're going to continue boy, on the boy. issue of race. Mr. President, you've just... <laughs> we got to talk about race. You're talking about Ukraine. Say, you want to talk about Ukraine. Uh, we need to talk about race. You know, you, you look back and like people's views change over time. So we're three years from that. We're three years from the beginning of COVID. And like masks have been, I think, thoroughly discredited as a means of prophylactic protection. Um, college educated American women have been totally discredited by the behavior of that specimen and many others. The sort of screechy, let's talk about race, systemic racism, <laughs> whatever COVID. It's like there's a certain upper income college educated American woman who is despised by like literally everybody in the country. I'm sorry to say it's just true. It's just totally everyone knows what I'm talking about. The different names, awfuls or different names from Karen or whatever, but like everybody gets the category. It's probably 15% of the total American population. They have wildly disproportionate power over everything, but they mostly have cultural power. And it's that kind of like hectoring stupidity. Let's talk about race. Like I don't think in this next election or any future election, people like that, whoever that moderator was, will ever be taken seriously again. I, I mean that. Oh, God, from your mouth to God's ears. I, I th- Maybe the only good thing of this chapter our country is in is how fast the experts and the college educated are just completely being defunct. They're just, they're, oh, we're never going to listen to Rochelle Walensky again talk about, <laughs> you know, COVID. Any of these so-called experts not listening anymore to those people. But it was very telling that we try to mire ourselves in race in this country and it has to be intentional. There's just not enough of it of racism to go around. And so it's Kristen Welker was the name of the moderator, by the way. So we have to just go back to arguing about race. And I just found it informative that we were trying to talk about Russia and talk about Ukraine in that particular case, but we wanted to get back to arguing about race. Well, and by the way, nobody actually wants to talk about race. Like, you're not allowed to talk about race in any sense other than, you know, one side attacks you for being white, the other side apologizes for being white. Like, that's the that's the totality of our racial conversation. Like, there are probably some interesting conversations you could have about race. You'd be fired immediately if you even tried. Right. I, I'm, I'm not that interested in the topic because I consider race like height and eye color something that, you know, you're not responsible for and you can't change. So, you know, there are certain realities associated with it, but let's accept them and move on. I don't find it that interesting. And I, I don't talk about it unless I have to. But of course, it's completely a distraction designed to get you not to notice they're looting the country. They're literally looting the country. So it's, it's like financial crimes are not really punished. What's punished? Well, questioning the last election, walking through Nancy Pelosi's office, bringing a Trump flag into Congress. That can get you shot to death. No problem. But like making up a fake cryptocurrency and looting a billion dollars. Well, he's a nice kid. You know, it's like they're looting the country. They don't want you to see it. Fight amongst yourselves while we steal. That's right. exactly what's it. All right. Well, you know, maybe the late, great Charles Manson had it right when he was 
trying to start a race war in 1971 and then take power. Uh, With the help of the FBI. And if you haven't read the book about Manson, it's. It's just an unbelievable. So Manson was clearly, you know, a, a federal uh, agent's too strong, but a source. There's an amazing book, and unfortunately, I'm 54, so I forget book titles now. But I read it last year, called Chaos. Maybe have you read this? No, but that sounds like an app title. I'm I'm I can't quite do it justice, but there's a reassessment of the Manson family written by a liberal celebrity profiler from LA who started out doing a 25th year anniversary piece, I think for LA weekly on the Tate LaBianca killings and ended up spending the next 20 years writing this book, which I'm sure most of your audience has read. I feel like I was the only person who hadn't read it until my son gave it to me, Uh, but it's fascinating. But basically what it concludes with a lot of evidence is that the feds were all over that story. I'm not saying they caused the murders, uh, but they were certainly in contact with Charles Manson. Like there's, you know, it's a lot more complicated than we thought it was. Don't I have, worry. I have the title chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA and the secret secret history of the sixties. Uh, it's an amazing book and it's not crazy. I, I really do recommend it. And you'll know every, I mean, it's about LA, so you'll know everything in the book and a lot of the people. Uh, one last quick break and we'll be back with a little more Tucker Carlson right after this. Well, let me tell you about meter. Still plenty of grilling season left. I'll say it's hotter than snot outside here, man. Plenty of plenty of time to spend in the great outdoors. How about the perfect tool to make sure you don't undercook or overcook your meat? Meter, sleek Bluetooth meat thermometer that guarantees a perfect cook every time. It's what you need this summer and next summer and into the fall. Hell, uh, Let's beef up those cooking skills. There's a countdown so you know how many beers before it's time to get back on the grill if you're in there watching the game. The Meter app will tell you exactly when to take the food off the grill so you don't open it too soon and you lose that heat. I'm telling you, the key, you know, you don't want to undercook, you know, chicken or pork or something like that, but overcooking the beef just dries it out and ruins it, and that's where Meter comes in. And then freedom. You don't have to stand there sucking up secondhand smoke all day and smelling like a briquette for the rest of the afternoon. Use it in a grill, oven, pan fryer, air fryer, uh, even a rotisserie. It's meter, right, Dawson? Barbecue season is still rolling, so get grilling with the best meat thermometer out there on meter.com. That's M-E-A-T-E-R.com. Well, good news. It's O Rewards Member Appreciation Month at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Get the most out of your membership. Shop, earn points, and get rewards sent right to your phone or email. If you're not an O Rewards member yet, sign up. It's quick and it's easy. You can do it online or in the store if you like. Just ask one of their professional parts people about joining O Rewards next time you visit, and you can start earning points on your first purchase. Sign up for both email and tax and get even more out of your membership. And right now, members receive two times, three times, up to eight times O Rewards points on select purchases. Those bonus points can help you get to your next reward even faster. You receive a $5 reward for every 150 O Rewards points, and you can use your reward on your next in-store or online purchase. So don't miss O Rewards Member Appreciation Month now at your local O'Reilly Auto Parts store and O'ReillyAuto.com. Tucker, I have thoughts, um, and you tell me. My my new sort of theory is when people are good, they can go out on their own, and when they're not, they have to sort of stay within the friendly com. confines of whatever structure corporate structure they're in or they're 31 years old and they just had a couple of kids and got married as we alluded to earlier uh but seeing voices like yourself sort of leave the nest and go independent and be so wildly successful really it, it bolsters my theory of when you're good and you have something to say then you can go independent and so when you broke off and uh, i mean you got 
let go and Don Lemon got let go at the same time. And all the entertainment shows were like Don Lemon and Tucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon sort of both looked at as the face of these competing networks, Fox and CNN, both gone. What's the future hold? I, I just said no, no future for Don Lemon because he has nothing to say. He says what CNN says and big future for Tucker because he's independent. He's a clear thinker and he's a very clear voice and people will find him. Um, And I feel that there's a kind of meritocracy that is a field level leveling that I'm really thankful for. I'm really thankful that guys like you are going to find a huge audience outside of Fox, and I don't think Don Lemon will. You know, I don't know. I I mean, I've been fired a number of times, and every time I've been so grateful for it, I do think it changes you in a good way. Success is terrible for men, as you know, having been successful. The more successful you are, the more arrogant, and stupid you get. And I don't know. I mean, being, I, I texted Don, I got, we got fired the same day and I texted him immediately. And I was like, congrats, man. You know, this will be <laughs> great in the end. I'm kind of rooting for Don Lemon. I don't know. Uh, Don Lemon. Um, mm-hmm. But in general, I do think there, I know some talented, I know it's a lot of not very talented people in television, but I know some talented people in TV who are still there. And a couple of them I've talked to and like, you know, it's pretty nice out here. You should come. Part of the way those those TV companies work, they're all the same in this regard, is they tell the on-air talent, like, you're a loser. You're nothing without us. They really get inside your head. I'm sure the movie business is the same way. And this is to lower the cost of talent. And they just constantly tell you how bad you are. No one ever says a good word to you. And, I mean, I never had that because I refused to talk to anybody in management for many, many years. I never talked to anybody. Uh, but, but most anchors do. And... They just feel so bad about themselves and so insecure that, like, they're afraid to go anywhere. Like, I'm a, lo- I know I need this stupid company filled with layers of dumb people making bad programming decisions in order to do my work. I mean, they really think that. So it's sad. I and I'm thinking of one person in particular who's like a legit old friend of mine who works at a big TV channel and he's famous, quite famous. But they mistreat the hell out of him. And I'm always saying to him, you know, no one's creative in your world. Like you don't know, you don't work with any creative people. They're all bureaucrats and functionaries. You are creative. You should leave. If you take a pay cut the first couple of years, no big deal. You'll be happy because you can do your thing. You can make your art, you know, without someone in your face all the time. But he's been so brainwashed that he won't go. It's sad. What's your take on a a wolf blitzer type? Because (laughs) uh, whenever I see (laughs) I, you know, take a close look at his history, actually. I, I'm always uh, like, why would he do this? Why would he say a bunch of stuff he doesn't believe or he must know is untrue? Like what? He sat there as this sort of elder statesman of news and just sort of lied right through through COVID and, and many other subjects. Why would he do that? Why would he do it to his legacy? Um, You know, I worked with Wolf for years, never had a problem with him. Um, it was always nice. Uh, you know, that no one wants to hear it. And I'm sure most people won't believe it, but I can tell you having lived it for many years, it's true. Uh, the Intel agencies have a big effect on what is broadcast on television and what you see on Facebook and Google as well. I mean, they're all up and down Facebook and Google, as I'm sure, you know, and, um, you know, there are a lot of anchors who, including, people I know well and have worked with at different networks. I'm thinking of one in particular, a national security reporter, who was just a mouthpiece for the Pentagon and the CIA and is knowingly telling lies on their behalf. It's very, very common, very common. And I can think of a number of people at CNN who I know for a fact are doing that exact thing. And so, I mean, they're reading government propaganda from the intel agencies knowingly and i'm sure they've got some internal rationale that allows them to get up in the morning and face themselves despite having done something that dishonest but i'm just telling you bottom line i know that is a that is true i'm not speculating at all um and in particular on the national security stuff there are very well-known national security reporters and i'm thinking of one female national security reporter in particular who just reads lies 
from the national security state. And it's wildly frustrating. And it would just make me mad. I mean, even if I don't agree with the lies, okay, but even if I did agree with the lies, I would be offended because they're lies. They're lies. Like when, the, you know, when CIA and the Pentagon were claiming that Bashar al-Assad used poison gas against his own people, okay, there was, there was no evidence that was true. I, I mean, maybe it was true. There was no evidence it was true. None. Zero. And I called them out and they could not provide any evidence. And yet every national security, and it was a big deal. I mean, we killed a lot of people in response. We sent in missiles and killed a lot of people. We took human life in response to that claim. And it was, as far as I can tell, a lie. And every national security reporter, every channel repeated it uncritically. The Biden administration blew up Nord Stream and, you know, created the largest act of industrial sabotage in history, the largest man-made CO2 emission in history in environmental crime. This is a huge deal this happened. And every national security reporter just looked right into the camera and said, well, we think Russia did it. Well, they knew Russia didn't do it. That's a lie. And they knew it was a lie. So I, I just think, and again, I'm not speculating. I spent my life in this business, so I've seen it. People underestimate the degree to which the people sitting on the news, possibly even Wolf Blitzer, are, are repeating talking points from the intel agencies and doing it on purpose. It's scary, man. Really scary. Well, one of the e interesting experiments I have for knowing if people are lying is when they say they know something that's not knowable. So they. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's crazy how many hard and fast political opinions are formed from like Wikipedia, which is itself, you know, curated very precisely by the intel agencies, the U.S. government, by liars in order to distort history but like if you get outside of wikipedia you can get facts pretty easily it's not that hard uh final question how'd you find trump in person it was nice to see him interviewed in a kind of relaxed setting you know my take on trump and i know him a little bit is he gets up on the debate stage and he, stage he gets so agitated that he ends up kind of steamrolling over his own points yes you know what i mean like when you're going to debate Joe Biden, you are fishermen with a marlin on the line. Just let out as much line as you want. He will tire himself out and you can gaff him on board. Do not do not keep fighting with him. He'll he will collapse his own arguments if you just let him answer your questions. It's, it's such an insight. I think because you're a performer, you see that really quickly. I think it's a very insightful observation about Trump. The more anxious he becomes, the less articulate he is. And so if you want to have an interesting conversation with Trump, and I do, I mean, I don't interview Trump, you know, I talk to him regularly, but I, I don't interview him very often. But when I do, I want to get, I want to have the most interesting possible conversation. I want to hear the most about what he thinks. And, and I, why wouldn't I? I mean, that's kind of my job. And then other people can decide what they think of it. But making sure that the, the environment is calm, that the conversation is calm, is the key to getting Trump to reveal who he is and to speak in a fluent way that you can understand. The opposite of that, it really, I don't think anyone read it, but if you're ever interested in seeing Trump at his most anxious and the results of it, go take a look at the transcript of the interview he did in 2015 or 16 with the New York Times editorial board. And he, you know, he's from New York, he cares about the New York Times, they were mean to him, they were piling on, you know, 10 against one. And Trump went so dada on them. He went so like verbal Jackson Pollock, just spewing paint everywhere that it's like, it, it's unbelievable, the result. You, you couldn't understand a single thing he said. It was all stream of consciousness, hallucinatory stuff. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I could elicit that. You know, if you yell at Trump and call him a racist or whatever, okay, you know, you'll get an answer you can't understand. But I, I don't want that. And the other point I'd make is that distinct from like, his ability as a manager, was he a good president? I mean, you know, you could debate that. But I like Trump, like, as a person. Like, I think Trump is hilarious. I think he's one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. I think he's really interesting to talk to. He's lived a life. He's 76. He's known every single person. What was Jackie Gleason like? Or he was friends with James Brown. You know, right. he'll, he'll, he'll spend 20 minutes telling you about James Brown and James Brown's various wives and his hair. And, like, he's amazing. And... I just like Trump. And, uh, you know, uh, politics aside, and I agree with a lot of his politics, too, but as a person, and I just think it's weird when everyone's like, oh, he's so disgusting. It's like, if you had dinner with Trump, even if you didn't vote for him, even if you hated his views, you would enjoy it. 
because he's a performer himself. He's a great performer. And um, he's a warm person, which I like. Yeah, I was just thinking of the contrast, and I'll give you a compliment, because you've been very animated and forthright and done the lion's share of the talking in this interview, which I appreciate, because that's why I'm interviewing you. But when you were interviewing Trump, you asked smart questions and then sat back. You didn't. Oh, yeah. You didn't make it the Tucker Carlson show, and I think that shows a high well, degree I of skill. Enough, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've had my share of talking. I don't need any more. <laughs> well, I'm going to give your vocal cords a rest, then, uh, Tucker, as we uh, head past an hour here. I really appreciate you coming on. I do. Um, as I get older, I realize conversations with people I like talking to are probably my my greatest pleasure yeah i know what you mean i feel the same way and i have you up there in a very short list of people i just love to have a conversation with well thanks adam i really appreciate that that was fun as hell i agree i hope we can do it again soon and uh please keep us posted on all the great new and exciting things that uh, are going to enter Tucker Carlson's world. Tucker on X is where you can go and you can follow him on X and uh, Twitter, the old uh, name, and you can shoot him a tweet at uh, Tucker Carlson as well. TuckerCarlson.com is where you go. And, and they're very well thought out monologues. And as I always say to anyone who listen, Tucker Carlson is a writer. Um, he does a good job of performing, but he is a writer, and I think that's your your strength, and that's what comes across in those monologues. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk again very soon, I hope. Thanks, Adam. Great to see you, man. You too. All right. You can go to uh, adamcarolla.com for all the live shows. Going to be at the Blue Note in Hawaii coming up September 8th. A couple of stand-up shows there. And then, oh, Las Vegas and Louisville and San Francisco. Just go to adamcarolla.com for all that. Until next time, this is Adam Carolla for Tucker Carlson. Say it. Mahalo. Mahalo.